Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome friends, so today we start another interesting lecture um, continuing in the tradition of discussing world cinema. We are going to talk about Canadian cinema as it is written over there, Canadian cinema which has its roots in uh, cinema verite, I am sure you remember what is cinema verite, almost like a documentary kind of cinema, uh, cinema which is true to life. These are the early filmmakers. Um, we have to understand that in Canada there are two uh, important languages, one is French and another is English. So, uh, Canadian cinema always hops the boundaries between the two, okay, two languages. So, we have, we, it is a very bilingual kind of a cinema. So, uh, the early filmmakers and these are all French names, French Canadians. Pierre Perelot, uh, Michel Brawl, Claude Jutra and Giles Carl. So, they were francophones and uh, from the 70s onwards and also in the 80s and some of these directors are also currently very active in filmmaking on the stage of world cinema. Dennis Arcon, Patricia Rosama who is known for her feminist take in films. Atom Egoin, an extremely important filmmaker. The focus of today's lecture will be on David Cronenberg and his cinema Body Horror. And then you also have filmmakers such as James Cameron and Jason Reitman who are of Canadian origins, but who have made it very big in Hollywood um, while still retaining their Canadian roots particularly in the case of Jason Reitman. The Canadian Pacific Railway set up a film unit in 1900. However, it was in 1939 when a National Film Board of Canada was established under John Grierson to counter the challenge posed by Hollywood. We have to remember this concept very clearly that Hollywood has always been an, uh, a very major threat to Canadian cinema. See, we are talking about North American continent, Canada and uh, the United States of America, they share the border and it is very easy to travel between the two countries and get permission to work in uh, each other's territory. So, filmmakers from Hollywood have always utilized this opportunity. Many of their films uh, are shot in Vancouver. Okay, because it is easy to shoot there, uh, permission is given easily and uh, infrastructure is readily available. So, many of the Hollywood filmmakers prefer to shoot their films in Vancouver. Uh, however, all these films which are shot in Canada, they are British products, uh, sorry, they are Hollywood products. And uh, as Hollywood cinema, as we, uh, most of us know, has taken over um, the world stage and it is very difficult for the indigenously produced films to get attention. So, um, Canadian cinema has always struggled and is still struggling to counter the challenges posed by Hollywood. Now, the board, we are talking about the National Film Board, it built up a department of animation and after the second world war, francophone Canadians made cinema variety kind of films. Among the leading filmmakers of this category were Pierre Perrault and Michel Brawl, names are written over the board. Soon French Canadian filmmakers became a major force in the Canadian film industry such as people like Claude Jutra, Giles Carl and Denis Arcon senior, uh, some of the greatest filmmakers since the 70s. Some of them are still like Denis Arcon are still extremely active. Again, and I quote here uh, the great Atom Egoin, to be a Canadian filmmaker is to exist in the shadow of Hollywood. That is 
a bitter truth that exists. Um, very often uh, an average cinegoer, he does not even know the difference between um, a Hollywood product and a Canadian product. Canadian films are extremely uh, uh, difficult to market and distribute across the world. We rarely get to see Canadian cinema except in uh, lesser film festivals. So, that is the reality of it. Coming to the great filmmakers, Atom Egoen, he is known for his thoughtful exposition on alienation, displacement and the amorphous nature of home and family. Family is extremely important in the films of Atom Egoen. His films incorporate innovative narrative devices of circular structure and uh, they are quite reflective intro introspective kinds of films. You do not find too much of hysteria or hyperventilating even amidst great tragedy in, uh, in an average Atamagoyan films. He has also done a lot of work for Canadian um, television, particularly documentaries with musical subjects. His best known film is a Sweet Hereafter, which is based on a novel by Russell Banks, where an insurance man comes to a locality traumatized by a, uh, by a recent event involving a bus accident, a tragedy. Um, and it is one of his best known films, one of his greatest films and uh, a very well received film. Uh, I strongly recommend that you watch Sweet Hereafter. His uh, most recent film uh, is uh, Devil's Knot, uh, I think it is a 2013 film is, which stars Hollywood stars Reese Witherspoon and Colin Firth and again as I was trying to prove a point that Canadian filmmakers have to look towards Hollywood to generate interest in their films. Here is a clipping from Atom Egoen's film Ararat. Denis Arcan is uh, known as the godfather of the new Canadian cinema and has made satires on Quebec society such as Jesus of Montreal and the barbarian invasions. In his uh, decline of uh, the American empire which is a 1986 film, a group of Quebec intellectuals discuss the problems of success, fidelity, intimacy and aging. Now, Jesus of Montreal is an important film, it was fascinated, uh, the director actually was fascinated with the lives of Montreal based artists who made a living as biblical figures by night. They would act out performances, public performances based on biblical stories and by daytime they would work in beer commercials and uh, very commercial kinds of uh, show, um, films. Okay, so, um, uh, he was fascinated by this dichotomy. Now, the protagonist of Jesus of Montreal is uh, uh, played by one of the greatest star actors of Canada uh, that is Lothar Bluto and uh, uh, he is uh, Daniel Coulomb in the movie. He is engaged uh, by a Montreal priest to improve on the parish's uh, representation of passion play, passion play you know as, the, as in uh, life and suffering of Jesus Christ, so plays based on that. But it, uh, the parish and the priest feel that uh, um, people are losing interest in this kind of theatrical form and something new has to be done. So, they approach um, new blood, new kinds of actors, new kinds of theatre exponents who can um, infuse new energy into something that has been going on and on for a very long time and people are, general public is losing interest. So, um, Daniel is uh, excited, he is a very quiet man, uh, very good actor, but not very flamboyant. Um, he is excited by the possibility and he invites a group of old friends to join him in revitalizing the ancient tale. So, together they stage the performance uh, by torchlight on the crest of Mount Royal with the lights of the vast city flickering below. 
So, it is very well photographed film, you know you have to just watch the film for its beauty of cinematography, its uh, Brechtian devices and also its uh, excellent plot. So, um, as Daniel and his friends revise their script, they make it more modern and engage the audience. The actors all manage to improve their personal life situations. Okay. A man for example, gives up dubbing his scripts for commercial kinds of films. A woman leaves an abusive partner uh, while she is playing uh, Magdalene. And so, they start living or embodying the characters. Daniel of course, starts acting like Jesus himself. The play is a huge success. But uh, soon clerical authorities are disturbed by the very experimental and avant-garde performances. In the absence uh, of support from the priest, the local authorities revoke the right to perform. Uh, so, uh, it is issued an order is, is issued that they cannot perform the play anymore. Now, the troupe gets extremely defined and they perform anyway. However, during and this is very interesting during the crucifixion scene, a uh, fight takes place between uh, the authorities and the theatre group and Daniel suffers an accidental head injury. So, he is taken by ambulance to a busy hospital where he is neglected for a while. He manages to discharge himself from the hospital, but collapses in a subway station. He is again taken to a hospital where he finally dies. It is a tragic story, but beautifully told. Here is a clipping from Jesus of Montreal. Patricia Rosema is uh, known for making films which are saturated with feminist passion and uh, um, uh, it has uh, actually, uh, she has broken new grounds, especially in the world of art, art house cinema. Most Canadian cinema is art house, okay. they have a strong message, they have a strong uh, sense of social consciousness. Uh, so, um, Patricia Rosema is, she tells us the story or uh, struggles uh, faced by women in their day to day life. She made her debut in 1987 uh, with a film called I Have Heard the Mermaid Singing. This is a story of an unfulfilled uh, 30 something single woman living in Toronto. Uh, uh, it was also a film that Rosama wrote, co produced, and edited, and the movie won excellent reviews. Um, she is also known for her 99, 1999 adaptation of Jane Austen's novel, Mansfield Park and the film became very controversial, you have to watch it to understand this. David Cronenberg, which uh, um, uh, who I am going to concentrate on in uh, today's lecture is one of the most successful Canadian filmmakers. He makes his films from Canada, but he has mastered the art of balancing art and commerce. An extremely conspicuous presence in world cinema since the commercial success of his film Scanner. Um, the English Canada, the English speaking Canada has never been very comfortable with Cronenberg. Now, um, it could be that his films very carefully tread the boundary between art and commerce and he is not what uh, an average Canadian filmmaker would be. His films always try um, to break certain new boundaries, but there is always a desire to be commercially successful at heart. He is an extremely original filmmaker and uh, um, he is, uh, uh, interestingly enough, he has not received great reception from his homeland, but is happening now, but for a large part of his career, he was by and large ignored by Canadian critics for some unexplainable reason. Um, he is uh, uh, 
often called a very interesting nickname is given to him that is Dave Deprave. Now, uh, he is also called the Baron of Blood. He is one of the principal originators of what is now commonly known as the body horror genre of filmmaking, which explores people's fears of bodily transformation. He has made a number of shockers and some of the early shockers are Shivers, Rabid, The Brood, Scanners and Videodrome. His subsequent films include The Dead Zone, The Fly, Dead Ringers, Naked R Lunch which is based on William Burroughs novel, uh, Madama Butterfly, Crash and Existence. So, these are his films all uh, uh, during the 80s and the 90s. Uh, these films have increasingly tended to downplay body horror in favor of aesthetic and psychological contemplation while his existence is a, a reprise of many of his themes and concerns. He is a staunch Canadian filmmaker nevertheless with nearly all his um, films including his major studio vehicles such as The Fly. Okay, all these films have been filmed in his home province that is Ontario. Uh, notable exceptions remain as Madame Butterfly and Spider. Uh, films which were shot in China and England respectively. Now, Revid and Shivers were also shot in and around Montreal. Most of his films have been at least primarily financed by Telefilm Canada and Cronenberg is a vocal supporter of government backed film projects saying every country needs a system of government grants in order to have a national film cinema or national cinema in the face of Hollywood. Okay. Now, Hollywood remains a major concern, but somehow David Cronenberg has uh, managed to work around his way. Now, coming to his uh, very popular, very successful and highly acclaimed Dead Ringers, it is a 1988 film. It had uh, the great actor star Jeremy Irons in a double role and uh, um, uh, the Montreal based uh, French Canadian uh, actor Genevieve Bujol, she was the heroine. It falls under the genre of medical horror and is adapted from the true crime novella Twins, which is a documentation of the Mendel twins, um, two New York gynecologists twins who committed suicide. Okay, to, uh, they were facing charges of malpractice and they committed suicide. So, that is uh, uh, very disturbing kind of a plot. Now, the movie has uh, Jeremy Irons playing the twins, twin doctor brothers Elliot and Beverly. They are not complete in themselves sort of complete or complement each other. Both characters have a feminine touch in them okay. and um, uh, the idea is uh, that uh, uh, Elliot attracts more women has a greater facility with the superficiality of uh, the everyday life, particularly with women. But in terms of uh, establishing emotional connect with women, Elliot is very unsuccessful. On the other hand, Beverly scores on this account, but he does not see this as an achievement. Instead, he views this as another part of his weakness. The movie is uh, set in Toronto, 1988. Actually, it begins with the uh, information Toronto 1988 um, and Cronenberg is very specific about the location. He, um, here the male mind and the female body are explored in the most literal of senses, avoiding prudish sensibility. Cronenberg always had a passion for science and Dead Ringers partly seem to stem from Cronenberg's lifelong passion for science, especially biochemistry. Uh, we get a glimpse of uh, the director's autobiographical impulses when we see the mental twins uh, in the initial scenes of Dead Ringers, whose fascination with the mysteries of human body is obvious by their early 
experiments in gynecology. Dead ringers in a true Cronenberg style explores an idea of imposed order with its blue lit examination theatres, sterile red gowns in the operation theatre and polished pent out surfaces in uh, the shades of uh, white and blue and grey. So, colours are important in Cronenberg and nowhere um, do colours play such an important role as in dead ringers. Again you have um, motives such as insects in the form of a specialty commissioned uh, set of surgical steel um, instruments again illustrating Cronenberg's juxtaposition of uh, the unassailably human with inhuman. This kind of cinema can also be called the womb envy cinema where the doctors specialize in the area of female fertility and later they become obsessed with the heroine of the film played by the actress um, Genevieve Bujo uh, and she is a mutant woman, she has some problems related to her gynecological health. What begins as a distraction for the brothers turns into a dangerous game leading uh, to their descent in uh, jealousy, rivalry and self destruction. Elliot's passion for Claire and uh, Beverly's discomfort with his twins love life and the brothers subsequent descent into self induced mis misery forms the crux of the plot. The film um, implies that there are two bodies with one soul and uh, turns it takes a very graphically uh, violent sequence uh, or a turn when the twins are depicted organically joined like Siamese twins. It is almost like an expressionistic device in as a dream sequence. As Elliot increases his dependency on um, drugs, he starts taking sleeping pills and all. Beverly plunges into guilt, he blames himself for destroying his brother. They use their band instruments to kill themselves, at the end both are found dead. Dead Ringers like most Cronenberg films evoked a deep sense of shock among the uh, audience, again I am uh, talking about the body horror genre. The film was particularly praised for its sophisticated acting and cinematography. According to Janet Maslin, among the films more hauntingly strange developments are Beverly's invention of a new set of surgical devices which frighten everyone who sees them. The brothers growing identification with the Siamese twins Chang and Eng and the drug addiction that finally leaves one brother utterly oblivious to the siblings fate, these are the scary points of the story. Crash was another controversial film, it is a 1996 film starring James Spader, Deborah Unger and Holly Hunter. Uh, it is, uh, it, uh, it falls under the category of speculative fiction. So, Cronenberg here explores his passion for the automobile, see automobile is a very important motive in, uh, in all um, especially literature and cinema from the north. American continent. We have had great literature based and great cinema based around in and around cars. Okay, so, cars are very important part of uh, integral part of the western culture, especially uh, the late 19th, early 20th and 21st century culture and many films have focused on cars as a motive. Okay. There is a research waiting to be done there, although lot of people have done some work there, but perhaps uh, you know one of you, some of you who are interested in doing this kind of work can do, can explore this and cars in cinema. Okay, so, um, here again Cronenberg explores his passion for the automobile. The film is adopted from J. G. Ballard's 1973 novel Crash and uh, here, he, uh, here Cronenberg documents uh, the nature of human tendency and uh, his fascination with the limits to which individual can 
push himself or can bear to endeavor to possess what they desire. So, the film's mood is essentially cold and grey under the metallic grey palette. So, it, the movie has again steel grey palette almost uh, mirroring the state of minds of the characters. The focus is on uh, James uh, Spader's character, he is a television commercial actor and uh, um, he, ha he has a wife played by Deborah Unger. In the first crash, we see James collide with another car on a freeway because he is looking at a set of storyboards while driving. The crash is over in a flash and we find the other driver dead on the hood of James's car. The dead man's wife as played by Holly Hunter, Helen is injured. Soon um, they are, uh, they get acquainted with uh, someone called Vaughan, a survivor of multiple crashes. He intru introduces James, uh, Helen and Catherine, Catherine is uh, his wife, to an entire cult built on fascination with car crashes. So, this is an important part. Um, J. G. Ballard says, uh, talks about crash as, throughout crash I have used the car not only as a, a sexual image, but as a total metaphor for man's life in today's society. As such, the novel has a political role. So, at its core, crash is a complex and frightening look at where the predictability and innovations of modern lives have led us. Uh, and at how dull our overstated senses have become, over saturated senses have become. Again like the book, the movie is a cautionary tale, at the heart it is a cautionary tale of how we might adapt to the environment that we have ourselves created, sterile and alienated from nature. So, that is the moral, see behind, beneath um, the strong graphic and violent content there is a message that um, and message could be the apocalyptic view of the world that we are all becoming more mechanized, mechanized and alienated, increasingly alienated from each other. We are losing the human connect. Crash thus unfolds without moral judgment presenting an unflinching vision of modern wild, all sort of you know jungle, a modern jungle, a kingdom man-made concrete and metal. This is what we have created for ourselves and this is what Cronenberg draws our attention to. So, we have to remember there is a thin line of demarcation between what could be considered extremely graphic and moral and here using certain graphic imagery, he's, uh, he presents uh, uh, us with an extremely moral and cautionary tale. Again, like most Cronenberg's films, Crash and Dead Ringers, they are not for the weak hearted. Crash was uh, received uh, well, uh, particularly at the 1996 Cannes Film Festival and it got a special jury award for originality, audacity and daring. Such a response from the judges of that prestigious event and a substantial amount of critical am uh, acclaim from other quarters did not prevent crash from being banned in England and um, having its release in the United States delayed by nearly 6 months. It is still uh, banned in the Westminster section of London on the ground that it would encourage something called road rage. That is Cronenberg for us. Politically, he is extremely active. In 1995, he met Salman Rushdie. At uh, that point, still deep in hiding from the fatwa issued against him and interviewed him at length for the Canadian magazine Shift. The similarity between the two could be to, uh, due to the fact that Cronenberg too has experiences um, with uh, moral vanguards and puritans trying to prevent his art from finding an audience. In terms of its mass marketability, Crash started out by hitting a lot of people in the wrong way. 
it could not be shown in certain countries and it served for much lively debates and it still um, sparks lots of debate on its content. In 2005, Cronenberg, Cronenberg made a um, big budget studio style film, A History of Violence starring Viggo Mortensen. Um, many of his loyal fans were disappointed, they felt that he has sold out to commerce, but then still the film is extremely entertaining and uh, uh, at the core it retains the essence of Cronenberg that is his enduring interest in the physical bordering on the metaphysical. Here is a scene from a history of violence. His next uh, big film was uh, Eastern Promises about Russian Mafia based in London starring Viggo Mortensen and Vincent Castle, the uh, great French actor. Um, Viggo Mortensen and uh, Castle, Vincent Castle again appeared in Cronenberg's A Dangerous Method which is an adaptation of Christopher Hampton's play The Talking Cure. Uh, the movie also starred Kiera Knightley and Michael Fassbender. The film focused on the relationship between Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and a troubled uh, Russian woman named Sabina is played by Kiera Knightley who went on to become one of the first female uh, psychoanalysts. Another interesting movie by Cronenberg is Cosmopolis which is a 2012 movie which is based on Don DeLolo's novel. The film functions as an urban road movie and it is set largely, you know the action takes place largely in the hero's head while he is uh, driving in his limousine, he is uh, a, a filthy rich Wall Street person almost in the category of uh, Sherman McCoy from The Bonfire of Vanities, the novel and uh, also there is a film uh, based on the novel and uh, again Gordon Greco as played by Michael Douglas in Wall Street that is an Oliver Stone film. So, all these Wall Street big wigs and again our hero here played by Robert Pattinson uh, who plays a character called Pecker and Pecker is going on uh, going in his limousine uh, um, on a long day's journey. The purpose of his drive is uh, seemingly to get a haircut at some old uh, traditional place. Uh, which he used to frequent in his childhood. So, that is the reason we are given, but then uh, in uh, during his time in the car, during his journey in the car, he appraises his life. For much of the time, he is in the car packed with computer screens flashing out the latest financial information from around the world. Occasionally, he leaves the car to visit uh, um, an old kind of bookshop, a theater, a diner, a hotel and a sense of angst and paranoia starts building up. So, again coming to Cronenberg, the questions that interest him now remain the same as ever. How permeable is the borderline or the human body between one person and another, between one person and the natural world and our attempts to find new places in which to breach that border including telepathy, love gene splicing, surgical invasion, uh, other kinds of transgression, are these heroic or are they leading us towards our future doom? Cine uh, Goa, cinephiles have come to terms with Cronenberg's point of view where he says, I think that is a primary function of art and which is to do violence to the little cocoon that we sometimes find ourselves enveloped in. So, that is Cronenberg for you. Another great uh, director from Canada of Canadian origin is James Cameron. Of course, all of us uh, are extremely familiar with James Cameron. He has made some of the biggest money making and blockbusters, uh, blockbuster kinds of movies in recent times such as Terminator part 1, part 2, Titanic, Avatar and before that there was Aliens. So, um, 
and move on to talk now about Jason Reitman who is Montreal born and known for directing Thank You for Smoking starring Aaron Eckhart. He earned Academy Award nomination for his Juno which is a delightful film with Elaine Page and Up in the Air starring George Clooney. He also directed a Young Adult starring Charlize Theron. Although Rittman is known for his Hollywood hits, he maintains his Canadian roots and he does produce Canadian films or shoots on location somewhere in the nation. Each of his uh, films uh, has played uh, at the Toronto Film Festival. Uh, Rittman has been extremely encouraging of young Canadian filmmakers. His Canadian root uh, and heritage is especially reflected in his writing and directing choices, especially in the use of subtle humor and deadpan. Like a true Canadian filmmaker, he is also interested in cinema with a strong social message. Although his films are extremely popular, money making uh, films and uh, uh, they are accepted by all. They have a worldwide visibility. So, this is one director who has managed to straddle the two worlds very successful. He has touched on uh, forbidden topics such as uh, teen pregnancy in you know smoking as in thank you for smoking, job loss for example in up in the air. Here is a scene from thank you for smoking it's 2005 film. So, thank you very much, we will continue in our next class.